What's up, friends? Welcome back to another episode of NFT 365. And today we're going to talk a little bit about what Web2 tactics from marketing to communication to community building do not work in Web3. Yeah, that's right. There are certain things in Web2 and Web3 that are very similar, but there are definitely some things that do not work in Web3 that previously have worked with us kind of migrating into uh, from Web2 to Web3. But before we get in there, we have to jump over and give a shout out to our sponsor, Crypto Business Conference. Crypto Business Conference is happening in beautiful San Diego. I'll talk a little bit more about the Crypto Business Conference later on in the episode. But we're going to give a shout out for one of our projects. And, you know, most of you, you know, I got some feedback that you guys like a little bit of the, the throwback shout outs to some of the projects that we are buying, you know, since we are buying an NFT every single day for a year. And so we're going to go back to a project called WizKid. And WizKid, we minted on June 8th. And I was, I was actually 40, year, 40 years old back then because uh, my birthday was the next day. So that was way before I turned 41. And we minted them on um, June 8th. And they were number 210 in our collection. Uh, and we minted them for 0 0.05 Ethereum. And today they have a floor price of 0 0.09 Ethereum, which in this market um, is pretty impressive for them to be going up, a majority of projects going down. Uh, they have a little over 4,000 total NFTs in the collection. Uh, they have 623 individual owners, and they've already done 60 plus uh, you know, Ethereum in secondary volume. And the thing I'll tell you that I like about this project, the art is really neat, but it is a... Um, it is a project that has Web3 utility for non-traditional gaming is what they kind of talk about it. And they have a, they, their roadmap is very dialed in. I actually really liked their roadmap back when we, when we minted it um, originally. And they also have, you know, within their roadmap, they have uh, reward mechanisms, staking, and some of these really cool things happening um, across the, you know, every quarter. Um, and then they have like, even these like, you know, gamified adventure pools that you can do. So for me, like the game, the gaming NFTs, I feel like there's a lot of them out there where, where they're an, a gaming component. But what I find really neat is when ones are that understand not only how to build the audience, but how to create, you know, gamification within a gaming NFT. And I think that's actually a, a probably a really important point that I just want to tap into real quick. And it kind of fits perfectly into our, you know, our uh, segue into today's episode. And there is a difference between gamification and a gaming NFT, right? So gamification, which, you know, I like to think of it, it comes in all forms. Uh, one of my favorite gamification uh, apps or components was Foursquare. I don't know how many of you used Foursquare. Um, I actually still use Foursquare. I could pull it up, but we're, we're live streaming over here on the, on the Instagrams at the moment. But Foursquare, when you would check into a location, they would give you these coins. And then whoever had the most check-ins at a single location would become the mayor of that location. Now, what could you do with these coins? I still, to this day, have no idea but I have over 10,000 check-ins around the world. When I would go to new restaurants, new hotels, I would check in, I would get my coins, and I, I always loved being the mayor. I, I remember when we lived in Arizona, I was the mayor of Tropical Smoothie, Dunkin' Donuts, and the gym that was all in the same complex because I would go there so often, I became the mayor. So that gamification you know, adds a game layer into you know, normal tasks. Now that is different than actually going in and logging in and playing a game. And I think one of the main things about that is like, I'm a fan, like I, gamification works on me. I mean, I don't know how many of you that are, are listening right now that you can raise your hand. Does gamification work for you, right? That, and for me, it does. Now, the gamification for participation trophies, which is really what that was in uh, Foursquare, right? I didn't get anything before being mayor. The only thing I got was when someone else checked in at the Tropical Smoothie, it would say, thanks for checking in. Did you know, you know, iSocial Fans is the current mayor of this, right? So like that was really the only kind of um, perk or, you know, kind of uh, reward was that, you know, little bit of validation. Um, but in Web3, one of the beautiful things of that is that we can actually add gamification in things like play to earn, learn to earn, but we can actually reward people with social tokens 
or NFTs. So that is such a, a different kind of a transformation in something like gamification, right? Like traditional gamification was like, hey, let's just give people points and see who accumulates the most points um, at the end of the month. I will also tell you as someone that deployed gamification inside of a multiple uh, social business tools, um, I, I deployed a lot of uh, employee advocacy solutions for different brands and businesses that I worked with. A lot of the gamification was a pain in the ass, truthfully. Like having to manage it, having to figure out and making sure people did the things that they did. The beauty of gamification in this blockchain era is that it can ultimately be done autonomous. It can be automated and, and completely done through the blockchain, right? Because the blockchain adds that layer of authenticated validation, Right. So if you know within like that game that I was just telling you about the WizKid game, right, what they can do is they can say, if you hold this NFT for six months, we're going to give you this. Well, what's beautiful is they can create a, you know, a code that says every day, check to see if anyone has this token on the blockchain and has had it for six months. If they have, give them this. Right. So like I always like to say, like smart contracts to me are very, you know, elaborate or basic, if this, then that, that statements. And you don't even have to be a coder to understand if this, then that statement, right? If, if, if the token does this, give them that, right? If it doesn't, go to the else part, right? Like if it doesn't have six months, go to the next, uh, you know, line of code or the array of code. So that's one of those examples that, you know, when we think about gamification, Maybe it didn't work in your brand or your business. Maybe it didn't work for you as a creator. You know, like I know for me, one of the things that I tried to do in the live streaming space, we're live streaming on uh, Instagram right now, was I love to reward what I called repeat viewership. And here's the crazy thing. How did I manage repeat viewership in Periscope days? Um, there was no... There was no um, export of users. There was no way for me to know who was watching. What we ended up doing was it, during my live streams, my team, who uh, shout out to Tink, rest in peace, uh, a good friend of mine uh, who, was, who ran the back end of my uh, live streaming business, um, she would, what she would do was she would screenshot the active viewers list on our Periscope. So we would go back into the replay and say, who, who watched our live stream, okay? We would put that into a spreadsheet, and then when I would do a live stream the next day, we would pull up that spreadsheet and say, who in the spreadsheet is also in the live stream right now? And then I would reward them with things that we had going on. Maybe it was a you know, free access to the online course. Uh, maybe it was uh, you know, stickers or things that we had uh, with press the damn button or think like a fan. But what I can tell you is that it was a pain in the ass because we were literally screenshotting a list of people, manually entering them in an Excel spreadsheet and then verifying them you know, manually. What's beautiful in this blockchain day and era that we can actually change the way that works, right? So imagine if I was live streaming to a, a website that required all you had to do was you know, verify with your wallet, right? So when you go to the website and we can do that, I could do this right now. Today I could do it if I wanted to, right? I could embed a video on a gated landing page and say, hey, if you watch this, uh, you know, video, connect your wallet. They'll just sign their wallet. There, there's no like hacking there, right? It's just they, they hit sign. And then what I can do is when someone shows up, let's say three days in a row, there's nothing I have to do manually, Right? I could be on the live stream, my team doesn't have to be watching, but we can literally create a, a, a nice little if this, then that, right? If someone watches the live stream three times, reward this token ID with this airdrop. So I could airdrop them a free NFT directly into their wallet. So that's just one of those kind of like neat ways that we can rethink the ways that things, something happened in web two to web three. Now, Another thing that we have to really reimagine and that doesn't work from the Web 2 days is that in the Web 2 sense of like digital relationships, a lot of it was just getting people like, hey, if I get people onto my email list or if I get people onto, um, you know, that are following me, 
now they're kind of further down the funnel. Now they're, you know, more, you know, kind of on that pipeline to make things work. Now, the problem with that is that, you know, one of the things that I've been hearing from a lot of brands, a lot of businesses is they will say like, Brian, what is the, what is the number of people I need to get on my white list? Or how many people should I have in my discord for before I can launch, right? Or how many people, like, what is that, like that level? Well, here's the truth. The likelihood of someone buying your NFT, or even, even if it doesn't cost anything, right? The likelihood of someone claiming your NFT, right? So just to clarify, right? You can set up a claim that just says on this day, show up to this website, they hit the claim button and they get the NFT for free. Maybe they pay gas. Or you could do, you know, a buy, right? And you could buy it, you know, technically you could do a buy for free where they just mint it um, and they just pay gas for it as well. But the thing about that is, you actually have to have somebody that has a wallet, right? So compared to the, old, the, the other day and age, right? If I got them in my email address, and let's say I, I had a sale going on, my only like barrier on that like sale to close, you know, from you know, top of funnel to closing the sale was I just needed to get them, I needed to get their attention, I needed to get them over to my sales page, and then I needed to close them there, they can hit checkout. In right now, where we are at right now, there's an education play that is required because we have to teach people how to set up a wallet, why a wallet is important, how to secure your wallet and not give away uh, your seed phrase. But you might be asking, well, then why would I go through all of that? Well, here's the reason. Because compared to getting someone that's following you or getting someone that is on your email list, that is just us, you know, ending up in their inbox. And I don't know about anybody, but I don't know anyone in my world that says, please, could someone send me another email or another brand could send me another email. But in Web3, once we get our NFT in their wallet, we now have their wallet address, right? So we can now actually gift them things anytime we want based on the fact that we know their wallet address and we can verify that they're holding our NFT. So one of the big changes is this HODL mindset or holding mindset. And I talked about that actually on yesterday's podcast episode as well. But the reason that is so different is because, let's face it, most e-commerce especially, but even for, you know, I know I have a lot of creator friends, a lot of speakers, a lot of authors that, um, you know, listen to the, the podcast. Here's the other thing that we just have to realize. The days of just getting someone to buy something and then hoping they use it are over in Web3. Let me say that again. The days of selling an online course and being like, hey, I'm gonna sell this course as long as I get them through the funnel and they buy it, you know, I know that you know, only 20% of people you know, complete my online course, but once I give them that, you know, once they buy the course, you know, it's up to them. Well, in Web3, this exchange of digital ownership what, what we would be doing is rather than having someone buy just an online course, you could have them buy an NFT and that NFT grants them access to your course. But here's the difference. If they do not no longer think your course is valuable or maybe they're no longer using it, they could sell that NFT to someone else and then that person can use it. Now, if they sell that NFT, you get a, what, a creator percentage, right? You have a, um, a, a percentage that is baked into the contract. Now, the percentage can range from 3% to 10%. Um, it's kind of like the average right now in this space. Um, I do know a couple of projects that have a higher um, you know, percentage fee depending on you know, what, what nuances are there. But the reason that this is so important, the reason this is mindset shift is so different from Web2 is that that point of sale, when, so, when you close the sale, is no longer the end of that transaction. I know some people are like, Brian, we've never treated our customers that way. Here's the truth. We have to be honest with ourselves. Do you know when we cared about a past customer? When we went to sell them to, be, to buy the next thing. There's usually a, a pretty big gap in between someone buying a digital service and the time that we interact with them later on. It's just the way that Web 2 has always worked. But in Web 3, this exchange of ownership and this idea that we're not just giving someone, you know, individual access for something, we're actually, you know, kind of giving them access to what can be a, a, a whole bunch of things, right? Which I think is pretty interesting in that component. 
The other thing about, you know, in this whole Web3 space when it comes to the blockchain and some of this interaction is that one of the things that we also have to just recognize that doesn't work, you know, from Web2 to Web3 was the idea of just, you know, relying on you know, your past track record. Because I will tell you, and I said this in, I said this in Web2 as well, but not a lot of brands or businesses kind of uh, believe me, I think, is that, you know, traditional Web1, I remember this, right? People would be like, well, why are you buying for that business? And they would be like, they've been in business for 65 years. Why would we not buy from them? In Web3, especially this early adoption phase where we are right now, a lot of the brands that are big brands or brands that have been a while in, a, in for a while have really dropped the ball, have not done a great job of delivering value in the NFT space. Now, you might be asking why that is. Um, I think there's multiple reasons. One of the reasons is they're not investing enough time up front. One of the other reasons is they're probably hiring a Web2 marketing agency that claims to be a Web3 marketing agency that has yet never collected NFTs, have never transferred NFTs, have never built out their own smart contract. Um, the other problem with a lot of the brands and businesses is they're looking at, at NFTs as a nice to have for their customer relationship, not valuing it the same as we would, you know, getting someone into our email funnel or getting someone to sign up to even a, a webinar on that side as well. And then the last thing is, you know, the, the, there is an element here of community and the fact that, you know, the, when you get access, when you have a, because the other part of this that is really interesting is that, you know, unlike traditional, you know, marketing or, or approaches, usually there's not a limited supply. And if there's a limited supply, it's usually of only a product. But what if we, we kind of change that way and say, here's a limited supply of your access to services? Well, now that changes everything, right? Because the beauty of it, in my opinion, is that you become, you're able to not only kind of sell out or build out the, the access based on like, you know, you know maybe you want to only have 500 people at one time can have access to your online course or to your services or your products or whatever that may be. Well, what's beautiful about that is at any one time, only 500 can hold that NFT, but that same 500 is not going to be always there, right? You'll have a different amount of people that are holding those NFTs. And so when you factor that in, you're now limiting some access. You're providing, you know, because the, let's remember, in this space, supply and demand is a big thing, right? It's a big, that's how the value will ends up, you know, increasing, right? If there's infinite supply, then the, you know, the demand, not only the, the, the amount of demand, but the value of holding something simply goes away, right? I've heard people tell me this, like, well, Brian, why don't I just mint a um, hundred thousand NFTs and I'll give them away as they go, or I'll, I'll sell them as they, you know, as they happen. Well, here's the, here's the truth. If there's a hundred thousand of them, there's no value in me buying one and then having the ability to sell it. Because why would anyone buy one from me when they can just buy one of the infinite supply that exists? So when it comes to marketing, when it comes to communication, we really have to change that variable. And I think one of the biggest things is we can no longer talk at our customers because that customer that is holding our NFT in this space is more than just your drive-by customer because they hold a limited supply of something that your brand or your business is providing you know, access or whatever that might be for the, on top of that. So that's a big change, a big shift. Another big shift, and if you go back and listen, uh, Gregarious, I, I had Gregarious on the podcast and we talked a lot about conversations, right? Where we have to move from like email messages or from content creation, and we have to focus on the power of these conversations. And part of the reason that is, is well, the two places that a majority of your NFT interactions happen at today, right? If you're listening to this episode six months from now, maybe there are other places where um, the, the conversations and communities um, kind of come together um, outside. But right now, the two main places are is Twitter and Discord. And if you've never been in Discord, Discord functions based on, a, on channels that you can provide, <clears throat> excuse me, gated access to, but it's very much um, threaded conversations. And then, of course, Twitter, which I like to think, I call Twitter 
Twitter, is, in my opinion, is an unfiltered fire hose of one-to-one conversations that happen in public. And so if you think about it, those conversations on Twitter and Discord require us also to change how we communicate with somebody. Like, I would actually argue the old days of getting someone from an NFT into your email box, to me, is only one of those things, right? Only one of those parts. And I've done a a bunch of episodes on why I think a lot of the communication tools that we're using are currently broken right now. I think we need to get better with SMS messaging. We need to get better with how we use email marketing in the NFT space. Uh, We need to get better on what direct messages or direct message groups uh, mean in this space. But when it comes to Web2 kind of like standard strategies, I would actually argue now it's not about just getting them in one place, but it's saying like, okay, are they following me on Twitter? Are they active in our Discord, which Discord gives you that data? You can log in and say, how many people have been uh, inactive in the last 30 days, right? And you can see who's been inactive. And, then, and so then we have to, to kind of like recognize that component. The other component that no longer kind of works in Web 2 and the Web 3 world is that building in a silo and then just kind of dropping it on your customers. Now, in Web 2, we, we kind of operated from the world of, you know, maybe, you know, for upcoming release, we would say, hey, something's coming in 10 days. Maybe we would give people a preview of what's, you know, upcoming. In the Web 3 world, because this, there's a shared ownership in this, you know, NFT collection or in this, you know, NFT project, the idea of creating in a silo doesn't work, right? Because now those that hold your NFT want, you know, hey, I have ownership in it, right? Because here's, here's that piece that you have to remember. They want you as the NFT project or the brand to be successful more so than any customer relationship to a brand in history, in my opinion, right? Like I am Delta Diamond. I've flown over a million miles on Delta Airlines. I'm a huge fan of Delta, but guess what? Delta's success as an airline has zero impact on me. If they make more money this quarter, I get no nothing. Even though I'm a diamond medallion member, I talk about them on social media, I only religiously fly Delta Airlines. My relationship as a customer is just like, hey, I hope they, you know, they they take care of their pilots and their stewardess because you know I love using them as an airline. Now in Web3, The difference is if I own one of 10,000 NFTs and if those 10,000 NFTs all of a sudden become higher in demand, more people want to have access to them. Well, the one that I hold is now worth more money. So in that case, now if we think about it, that customer relationship is more, you know, it's collaborative, right? Because I want you to succeed, right? And this is something that I, I, I think I don't, I don't think it's, it's stressed enough in the NFT space. NFT owners want the project to succeed just as much, sometimes even more, than the NFT founder does for what their project is doing. That's pretty interesting dynamic, right? Because even when you build customer communities or Facebook groups or whatever that may be, although there's like this like, you know, camaraderie and people coming together, there was not that rising tide lifts all boats. Now you might be saying, well, Brian, we don't, we're not doing a financial type of component of NFTs. Well, let's face it. It's not just about you know, exclusive access because of the price. Let's, let's put an example here, like a, a restaurant in your area that is impossible to get a ticket, uh, a, a seat to, right? You have to make a reservation 30 days in advance or you have to, you know, you have to know somebody that knows somebody. Well, there's not a financial component there, right? You don't pay money for access to that restaurant, but because there is a limited supply of seats at the restaurant, those seats become more valuable to the people that can get the access, right? Like I have a friend um, who, you know, I'm traveling uh, next month and he's like, Fanzo, you're coming into town. I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to get us a table at such and such restaurant um, that, we, that we we're going to. And I was like, sweet, I, I'm excited for that. It's awesome. Now, for them, the, their, their ability to get that limited edition access into a restaurant, to me, is it, it, it raises their value because, they hey, wow, they have those connections to get me in. Well, if we think about that in the NFT space, even if I didn't pay for my NFT, and even if there's not technically 
a financial secondary market that I'm worried about. What I get for holding that NFT can be the value and the reason that other people would want it, right? Like, and I mean, just like, let's throw it back to that diamond medallion, right? If I was able, which I cannot do now, but if diamond medallion status was something that I could sell my status to someone else or I could gift my status to someone else, well, that would hold a lot of value, right? If someone was like, Brian, I know you're not traveling next year, you, you know, you have a change of plans. Uh, I'm wondering, you know, would you gift me or would you sell me your diamond medallion status? Well, I get upgraded to first class just about every flight that I fly on, thanks to uh, Di Delta Diamond. I get access to their their club. I get uh, I can check extra bags. I get unlimited uh, changing of my flights. All of those perks are built on top of my medallion status. And so what we have to think about there is the difference really being is that I don't really I don't own that status or those miles in a way that allows me to want Delta to equally be successful. Because if you think about it, if, if it mattered, right, if, if Delta's evaluation made me, you know, more money or, you know, increase the value of my, um, you know, my Delta, uh, you know, membership, then I would probably talk even more about Delta or try to convince my friends to get on Delta. But the funny part about it is I actually don't want you to fly Delta Airlines, because if I get more people that travel a lot like me, the chance of me getting upgraded is now less. So in a way, we're almost decentivized to promote things where we have exclusive access because it would increase this infinite supply and then I, it wouldn't work. But what if there was only 100,000 people that could get that access to the, uh, the diamond access and once you were in, you were in, well, of course I would promote the hell out of it because people can't get to my level because there's that, you know, there, there will be demand, but there is a limited or finite supply. One of the other things that we have to think about in this, you know, relationship, this web two to web three, you know, world <clears throat> is that the idea of someone wanting to buy into what you're, you're doing or you're, you're selling or serving, the, there's, there's multiple components into this, right? Because it is not only thinking about what is, if I buy this NFT, what is it getting me now? But it's also, what do I get for holding it? And will there be an implied value or future rewards down the road? So in Web 2, we often worried about like, once someone's a customer, right? I've heard, um, I think it was Richard Brunson talk about this um, a, a lot, right? And he would talk about, um, you know, the idea uh, or, Richard Branson. I said Richard Brunson. I, oh, I think I'm combining two different marketers. Um, Richard Branson, the idea of like once someone flies or once someone buys from me, right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, you know, they pay for shipping and handling. Once they make that transaction with me, the, the percentage chance of them buying future things with me goes up, right? That's just the, the basis of marketing. Well, in this space, that is true to a sense, right? Once I own an NFT and if your project has been delivering me value and you launch a second NFT or you launch a, a next phase of your NFT, the likelihood of me buying that is probably definitely going to increase, especially because you're probably going to give me early access because that's kind of how that whole NFT space works. But what is so different there that we really have to factor in when it comes to this, you know, how we market, how we communicate is that there is that idea because here's the, here's the downside of this. If I went on and, and, and I, didn't, I can't see the, I could pull this up right now um, on this project. If I went and looked at how many NFTs from this collection that I, you know, I mentioned at the beginning of the show. So I told you there's 4,300 NFTs. There's only 600 or so owners, right? So they're in this collection, they have a small amount of owners, but they all own a, a high percentage, right? Almost what, six or eight, you know, between six and eight, the average person owns between six and eight of these NFTs. Well, that's a, that's a great stat. Like, okay, cool. We have a lot of, you know, loyal people, but what if I'm going to, and I'm going to, I'm going to do this live on the, uh, the podcast. So what if, how, but the, the problem with this becomes how many of them are put for sale, right? Because it's not only what is the lowest price someone is selling something for, but if that's, and I use the gym membership all the time, right? If a gym membership only sold 300 passes, right? And you had three gyms to choose from. 
And all three gyms have 300 NFTs, and those NFTs are what give people access to the gym. If one gym only had 10 NFTs available for sale from their customers, the other one had 100 for sale, and then the other one, let's just say, was somewhere in the middle. Maybe they had 50 NFTs for sale because people had given up that, that don't want to um, you know, attend the gym. Let's face it, when you are evaluating those gyms, and there's three of them, they all have the same amount of supply, the one where less people are going, are want to sell it, right, where, the, where there's, there's less supply available, you're, you're going to hold that gym at a higher regard because you're like, wow, those people really love their gym so much so there's only 10 people that want to exit it. Because then what you're also going to say is, <clears throat> what the hell's wrong with this other gym? Because there's 100 people that are ready to get out of there of the 300 that they have. And so that, le that level of, if we are dissatisfied, we can make, <clears throat> we can use, well, we can use our voice. We can use, you know, the ability to sell. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Uh, I had to take a drink of water real quick. We can use our ability to sell something, right? And that also we get to determine the price. So the, the secondary market, right? What, what something is valued on the secondary market is not, that is not created by the founders, it is not created by the brands that are working, right? So Nickelodeon, you know, dropped an NFT recently, right? With that NFT, they have a bunch of perks and things that they're rolling out. Um, they're going to do like a slime drop. They have a really a bunch of things that are happening. But they rolled out that NFT and you could buy the pass, I believe. You could buy the packages originally for like between $100 and $300 USD. Well, when there was only, there's only a limited supply, all of a sudden the price point for the floor, what people were willing to sell it for, was 0.2 Ethereum which at the time I think was more like almost double, right? $600 was the minimum of what people were, were selling it for. So on secondary market, the, we as the NFT owners decide what that value is. Now, funny enough, it started at six, $600 for the Nickelodeon one. I believe it went up to about $900 to $1,000 to buy one of them. But since then, it's actually gone down, where right now, I could actually buy a Nickelodeon NFT on the secondary market for below what people bought it for on day one. So what does that mean? Well, that means people either are dissatisfied or they don't no longer value, maybe they got out of, what, out of the NFT what they wanted. And now it's up to Nickelodeon to add value, to increase the, you know, uh, the, the, the communication so that people not only want to hold, but that the people aren't willing for, to sell it for uh, you know, a lower amount, right? Like, and like, there's a, the, like the reason that, you know, the, let's flip on the other side, right? Board Ape Yacht Club. The reason Board Ape Yacht Club has such a high floor price is because all of their owners are like, I'm not willing to sell this unless someone gives me $100,000. Well, if everyone that has access to a private something is, and they all kind of agreed that it's worth at least $100,000, well, the price of that is now $100,000. So what is really interesting in this is if you are a brand or you provide services, maybe you're an author, maybe you're a speaker, if what you provide, if you over-deliver and you, you are not only over delivering, but you are continuing to build on it and grow from that initial launch. Not only will that be something that your owners will, of uh, that NFT will value, but guess what? That also will make you more money because remember, the, the project founders are getting a percentage of every secondary sale. So I, of course, as the owner, I want the floor price to go up. Because I want the sales, if people are going to sell them, to be at a higher price because then my percentage of this is higher. So the entire mindset of marketing, of PR, of comms, of funnel management, of community building, uh, of content creation, even content creation. Because traditionally right now, most brands, most businesses, most startups create co content for, new, for, for future customers, right? We create content to attract our next customers. Well, in Web3, you're gonna to wanna to create content, conversations, and be active in the community to activate your existing customers. 
So rather than trying to always get more with your content, you need to provide content that educates, that inspires, that motivates, right? I mean, what do you think we're doing here with the podcast, right? I'm delivering a podcast episode every single day for a year. Free, open, educational content, right? Because I understand that value. I also understand that when we drop our NFT project, it's a game of trust, trusting that I will deliver, trusting that I will continue to show up, and trusted that I'm committed to, you know, not only valuing those that are owners, but I'm committed to this space. Well, I'm proving that here with this podcast on a daily basis now, 257 days in a row. And so a lot of the, the web two tactics of get people in the funnel, attract new customers, always need to grow, 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 is actually switching now where imagine this, in web three, it's about building out your true fans and then providing value. So rather than focusing on growth, you're actually focusing on nurturing. I actually think to me, that's the, the massive shift that we have to think about in Web3, where it's, it's more important to nurture your existing holders than it is to market for future holders. Now, you still have to do that because that's how you, you continue to increase the, the demand, which of course rewards on the backside. But Definitely some interesting nuances there between the two. Twitter and Discord are changing the way that we think about communication. Twitter Spaces is literally the, the number one um, you know, uh, space where, uh, space, uh, number one spot where people are, are, are listening, they're learning, they're finding new, new projects. So guess what? If you're a brand or a business, uh, most of you, and, and this is gonna be a hard truth, most brands and businesses, and they don't trust their employees. And you're like, Brian, that's crap. What do you mean that these brands and businesses don't trust their employees? Here's the point, point in case. How many brands or businesses today would let any of their employees go live on their Facebook account? I'll wait. I'll wait. How many businesses would allow them? Now, now the funny thing about that is, aren't those employees on the payroll? And aren't they committed to you know, the brand's success? Well, one could argue that's an interesting you know, world we created where we want the employee to trust the brand, but in many cases, the brand isn't willing to demonstrate that we trust the employee. And I speak on that because I've worked with lots of executives on employee advocacy and social business growth. Like how do we, how do we leverage our employee base to tell our story, to become our marketers? Well, the biggest piece of that is you have to trust your employees to not only be the voice and the marketers of your brand, but to actually put them in that, that scenario. Well, in the Twitter space world, you're going to have to give them that keys, right? Because it's not only just the brand account that is speaking on a Twitter space, but it is every one of your owners. Every time someone that is an owner of an NFT is going up there and talking about your project, they're in many cases being your marketing and your sales. They're helping you increase the demand because to that finite supply. And so in a, in a second component of this, we have to be really, we have to, we have to be better. We have to increase our focus on helping those that are NFT owners tell our story. Like I would argue if you're listening to this right now and you are an NFT project owner, or maybe you, you advise projects. The number one thing I would tell right now, if you want to work on and during this bear market, is what materials do you have to help your current NFT owners tell your brand story? I'm gonna guess very little. Well, you're like, Brian, well, we have a website. We have a description in our Twitter bio. Why, why don't you have downloadable assets? Why aren't you doing regular updates where you're helping people tell the story and the value proposition? Why are you not celebrating the fans of your projects and your podcast? Like for me, I will tell you, we got a message the other day that someone said, Brian, they had no intention of getting involved in the NFT space. Just recently, when they, when they discovered the podcast back in December, just recently, they sold out their entire NFT collection. And in their opinion, it was solely to do because they were listening to the podcast. They found a new use case. They were inspired. They took notes. They activated on what we, what we were talking about. Well, for me, I mean, that's a, I mean, how awesome is that? Sadly, though, in the Web2 world, most of those reviews just sit on Apple Podcasts or on LinkedIn. But in Web3 world, the, empowering those to be part of our conversation 
helps across the board. And it, it helped in web two, but we weren't as incentivized to do it, right? Because let's remember, if someone is like, you know what, I'm not really sure about this NFT project. And all of a sudden you help them tell the story and they're telling others about it. Doesn't that increase the likelihood of them holding that NFT and being proud about what they have? And if they're holding it and there's less you know, supply for sale, now the price of it goes up. So even though maybe there's 100 people that are selling and those 100 people are, you know, are hard to reach, what if you were able to activate 50 of them to decide that it's now more valuable for them to hold the NFT than it is to sell the NFT? Well, now, of course, the supply goes down. So now when someone's going to buy it, they're going to realize like, wow, there's only 50 of these for sale. I better jump in on them before they sell out or before there's none left or before the price goes up. So a lot of this, the psychology of marketing and sales, a lot of the components that exist, we have to really merge them from Web 2 logic into reimagining Web 3 positioning. So hopefully that inspired you. Hopefully got you, you know, thinking on, on some of these use cases that we have, you know, available to us. And, and you know, I'm excited to kind of tap into this even more. Uh, of course, we'll have some more episodes on this uh, in the podcast. Uh, you know, if, I appreciate if, you know, thanks for listening to the show. If you follow us on the social channels, we are NFT365 podcast on every channel. So we're on Facebook. We are on Twitter. We're on Instagram. Of course, you can jump into our Discord and come say hi. And lastly, you know, I mentioned I was going to give you a little bit more information about, you know, our sponsor, Crypto Business Conference. Uh, Crypto Business Conference is an event for marketers, entrepreneurs, creators that are looking to level up their knowledge on Web3 and NFTs. It's also an event that is being, you know, uh, that is being put on at the San Diego Convention Center. It is also put on by uh, an event team that has done seven plus years of live events that knows how to put on uh, an event, knows how to curate content on the stage. And for me, you know, I'm proud to be uh, not only having them as a sponsor here, but a media partner with them, uh, helping curate some of the, that content, helping you know to be a part of that experience. So uh, I hope to see many of you there in San Diego. I, I hope we will be able to, to run into each other, be able to uh, hang out and talk and, and get to know each other even more. And then lastly, uh, you know, as we wrap, I'll just say that you know, there are some things that you know, take some time. And we have to kind of just own, you know, the different components. Well, one of them happens to be merchandise for the podcast. I know many of you have requested, hey, can I buy stickers? Can I buy a hat? Do you have a We Is Greater Than Me shirt? Do you have any of the superpowered merchandise? Like, Brian, where's the merchandise coming? Well, as I shared on a past episode, I really wanted to deliver merchandise in a Web3 way. I wanted to be able to gate it via NFTs and tokens. I wanted to create different experiences. So if you hold one of our 1,093 true fans uh, NFTs, I wanted to give you a different experience than someone that just wants to come to the public site. Now, I thought that I could have, I could have rolled that out three weeks ago. But I will tell you, the gating and the mechanics were more complex and I needed to work with Shopify. I needed to work with some of the drop shippers and the distributors to kind of you know, enable some API access so that I could actually do that. The good news to it is I did about three hours of testing this morning. I have some more testing that will be coming up. But I, I got the gating to work. And I got the unique shopping experience to work. So transparently, I apologize for believing that I could have got it done in a sooner manner. But on the flip side of that, I'm excited to kind of back up what my goal and my, my vision was, is that if I'm going to preach the power of Web3 and I'm going to get on here and, and, and talk about, you know, why I believe every brand, every business will be integrating NFTs, I sure as hell better deliver things that I'm doing in that same way. And so I'm a big fan of that. And I would challenge everyone, right? Like, think about the, the projects, the services, the events, the things that you're, you're, you're going and are a part of. Are they preaching one thing, yet when they try to do something and doing it differently? What does that say, right? They're telling you that you need to activate in Web3, yet they're not activating in Web3 for what they're buying or what they're selling. We each can kind of decide how we take on that. So with that being said, my friends, I appreciate you for tuning in to this episode of NFT 365. And as always, we'll talk to you tomorrow. Cheers.